So pathological alienators have something else going on. They have a personality disorder of some sort. If the underlying disorder can't be treated, then you're not going to be able to treat the alienating behavior either. Now, we know that some people that could be pathological alienators don't succeed for a couple of reasons. Number one, because the children are too old. And, yeah. you know, 13, 14, 15, 16-year-olds, <laughs> they think they know more than you. So it's hard to alienate mm -hmm. a 14-year-old if you start there because they're going to look at you like, mm, I don't know. <laughs> it can even be hard to alienate a four-year-old. Because uh, right. they're much like teenagers, right? They're very defiant. Yep. And if they sense that you really want something badly, they're going to do the opposite. So the age range mm -hmm. where parental alienation at a pathological level really is effective is in that elementary school. Six, seven, eight, nine years old is where it can really take hold. And so that puts kids at that age at a higher risk. Hey, this is Diane Dirks. And I'm Rick Voiles. We've been working with co-parents in conflict for more than two decades. We've taught classes, written books, counseled parents, empathized, and agonized a few times to help people make sense of their complicated families. We were talking one day, and it occurred to us that helping the most difficult cases comes down to one simple concept. Is one parent willing to let go of the tug-of-war rope, or is it worth it to hold on and fight? So we invite you to take this journey with us each episode as we tackle the questions, should you hold on or let it go? Welcome to Co-Parent Dilemmas, where we give you practical solutions to those impossible co-parents. Good morning, Rick Voiles. <laughs> How formal. Good morning, <laughs> Diane Dirks. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. I'm giving you a little PR there. I'm saying your whole name. What's wrong with that? Oh, wow. Okay. Thanks. What do they say? Uh, good PR is, th there's no such thing as bad PR? I don't know. Exactly. I didn't say anything bad. I just said your last name. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. They so, can find me now. <laughs> so you've had a little bit of a week, I think, haven't you? Uh, yes. Yes. A medical emergency. Um, just kind of threw everything off. Um, I've had eye surgery and the recovery time. So I'm sitting at the doctor's office and she's describing, you know, all the dangers, all the risk, you know, you might go blind, blah, blah, blah. And I'm, I'm really worried about that. And I'm listening very attently. And I say, well, how long is the recovery time? She said a month. And my oh. face just went, <laughs> what? And she goes, oh, that's what you react to, huh? <laughs> I, I got to be out of, the of surgery. commission for I just, a month. Right. I just need to know what, what I'm <laughs> yes. going to be able to do after this is over. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad you right. got it fixed and you're going to see after all. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's all going awesome. quite well, but it is a change in routine. Yeah. And our listeners can't see you, but you kind of look like Captain Hook. <laughs> yes. Yes. With the so patch eye over patch your eye. So it's kind of yep. scary. I'm like, hmm, Rick is looking yep. a little intimidating today. So, all right. We, Rick, um, are going to embark upon a three part series um, that is connected to parental alienation. And as much as I hate that we have to talk about this. I think it's important to occasionally bring up these issues connected to parental alienation because most of our audience, I think, are in that high conflict zone. I don't think yeah. a lot of our audience are people who get along well. And because parental alienation is such a buzz phrase in our legal system, everybody is sensitized to it. Would you say? Very much. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, everything feels like parental alienation. And as we always try to do and give a unique perspective to something that is somewhat ubiquitous in our world, in our legal family court world today, I think it's important to talk about the nuances, the, the gray areas, the things that are not black and white about this issue. Um, I I'm involved in some social media groups around parental alienation because it interests me. 
to see what other people are saying. And there's a lot of anger around it. Um, understandable anger, but it's very mm -hmm. hard to know whether or not some people are truly alienated or they're participants in their own alienation, so to speak, without talking to people intimately and getting their details of their situation. And so just like everything else in social media, um, I think high emotion breeds high emotion, which breeds high emotion, which breeds more high emotion. <laughs> so there's a <laughs> lot of a lot of emotion around the subject, and it's not black and white. Is as no. even some professionals would claim that it is. Um, some people also think once an alienator, always an alienator, because it's in their it's in, it's in their psyche. And so I want to bring a different perspective to it. And some of it had to do with a recent email that I received from a listener who basically said after listening to our podcast uh, and exploring and ha reflecting on her own behavior, thinks that she might be an alienator. Hmm. And that's rare. Oh, gosh, yes. Now, I don't know her. I've had people come to me in counseling and say, my ex keeps telling me I'm a narcissist. Do you think that I am? And I always laugh and say, probably not, or you wouldn't be here. <laughs> you wouldn't be <laughs> investigating, yeah. <laughs> by definition, the narcissist is typically, typically anyone with a personality disorder, part of the disorder is not having the ability to self-reflect, right? And understand how you affect other people with your disorder. And so that's what makes them so difficult to treat because any treatment requires the person to admit or acknowledge I have a problem, right? Mm -hmm. So I did question whether or not she really is an alienator in coming to that recognition or whether she's just been told she's an alienator, alienator so many times by her co-parent that she's now believing it. And I can't know that for sure. But I think the big question that pops up, not only in my mind as a professional, but also in, you know, co-parents minds who experience this is, is this treatable? Is this fixable? And mm -hmm. I think there are professionals out there that wonder the same thing. Would you agree? Yes. Yeah. So what are your thoughts about that? Or where do you stand well, on in, this issue? Yeah. And it, it's interesting when I reflect on it, it means we often talk about the impact of alienation on the children and can the children recover and, or we talk about the impact on the, um, the parent who's being alienated against and what they can do. But yes, we rarely think about, or I've rarely thought about, well, what about the alienator themselves is it's almost like I lumped them in together with narcissists. Uh, narcissists can't recover and alienators don't recover. And I never think about the in, in, them as someone who's even capable. I don't know of many professionals who even ask the question, can alienators be um, um, rehabilitated? Rehabilitated. That's the word I was looking for. Yes. So let's start from the beginning. <laughs> I'm going to go back 23 years. Kelly and Johnston did a research art article in 2001 and published it in the Family Court Review. And even though it's 23 years old, it still has a lot of significance today for how we view parental alienation. And there are a couple of hmm. graphics um, in this article, and it's, it's called the reformulation of parental alienation, if anybody is interested in looking it up. But there's a graphic called the continuum of children's relationships with parents after separation and divorce. And if you look at the continuum, it starts out with, you know, kids, most kids have a positive relationship with both parents and they prefer contact with both parents after divorce or separation. Positive relationship doesn't mean perfect relationship. 
It just mm-hmm. means mm-hmm. they have a bond with that parent and they identify with that parent. And it's not uncommon as you move up the continuum for one child to have an affinity for one parent over the other. I bet most of our listeners, if you think back to your childhood, you had an affinity for one parent over the other. It doesn't mean you didn't want the other parent in your life. It just means I preferred one parent over the other. Did you feel the same way, Rick, as a child? Yeah. So I would probably say I preferred my mother over my father, not because there was anything wrong with my father, but because he was somewhat absent because he worked a lot and my mom was there. So I developed an affinity towards my mother. My parents did not get a divorce, but had they gotten a divorce, I probably would have preferred to live with my mother instead of my father because I had a stronger bond. That's Mm -hmm. normal. That's common. What we can see after separation and divorce is the affinity or the preference for one parent can start to look like an alliance. So you go from an affinity to an alliance. Now, how does an alliance form? Well, it could be a number of things. It doesn't necessarily have to be bad or result in something really negative, but an alliance is built typically because of history. Let's say that in the marriage, the child witnessed one parent hurting the other parent. So the child may become protective. So it would make sense after a divorce or separation that that child would ally with the one parent he or she thinks needs protection. But that doesn't mean, even when there's an alliance, that they don't want to spend time or be with or have an identity with the other parent. They still have what we call ambivalence. And I know I'm using a lot of A words here, but that's important. (laughs) We Uh want children to have an ambivalent attitude toward both of their parents. And Rick, why don't you define what that means? What does an ambivalent (laughs) attitude mean? We'll be back after a quick break. The heart behind the I'm on podcast is storytelling because every mom has a story to tell. I know that when I talk to my friends who are parenting and we share stories, we all end up feeling less alone and more capable of loving our kids. Well, you can find information everywhere on the internet. Some is bad parenting advice and some is pretty wise. We like to think there's a lot of wisdom on imom.com. And when you combine that signature wisdom with a great story, It brings parenting to life. We want a mom who's listening to see herself and her kids in these stories and rest in the confidence that she is the perfect mom for her kids. Check out the iMom podcast with new episodes every Monday. Well, it means in my mind, I'm thinking of that differentiating process as the children become teenagers, where I start to develop my own identity separate from your identity, whereas as an infant and a child, we're intimately connected. You are me and I am you. Right. So the healthy child has a healthy ambivalence toward his or her parent simply because children are self-centered, right? Right. I'm right. more important than anybody in the world. And I, even though I love my parents and I know I have to rely on them for sustenance, I still see myself as separate from my parent. I am not engulfed in within my parents' personality. I am not uh, absorbed by my parent. I am a separate person. My parent respects me as a separate person and I see myself as a separate person And ambivalence simply means that I recognize that my parents are not perfect, neither one of them, and they both have faults, uh, but I love them anyway because they're my parents, because my identity is wrapped up in them. So I don't see one as good and the other as bad. So that ambivalence is important for healthy development. As you move up the continuum, you go from affinity to an alliance and the ambivalence is is intact. Then you start to move into estrangement. 
that's mm-hmm. when the child begins to um, not have the ambivalence anymore and begins to say, okay, it's dangerous for me to love both parents. I need to pick one. Yeah. Because if I don't pick the one who's most compromised, I risk losing the love of that parent. I may pick the one who I know would actually (laughs) abandon me, or at least the one that I believe would abandon me. The one that I'm pretty sure unconditionally loves me can handle my estrangement. That's what goes on Mm -hmm. in the child's brain. So I, the child begins to form a narrative with the help of an alienating parent, begins to form a narrative in their brain that supports the reason for me to become estranged from the other parent. Does that make sense? It does. And that narrative typically begins, and it's complicated, often begins during the marriage in the marital or otherwise relationship where the two parents are together. It doesn't just pop up. That narrative typically begins early on to where the child begins to believe that their other parent somehow is not worthy to be seen. And, you know, these kids, it's not necessarily that they truly believe that that other parent is evil or bad. It's that they have to develop a narrative to believe that so that they don't lose the alienating parent. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. I've seen that. So the estrangement is sort of the first step. This is where as a professional, you really have to be careful because you have to decide what is the reason for the estrangement. Meaning what is Mm -hmm. the reason the child is saying, I don't think I want to see to spend time with the other parent anymore. And if you look at this graphic where it says estranged from one parent, there's an arrow that goes down to realistic estrangement. Or if you go up the continuum to alienation, there's an arrow that goes to pathological alienation. So as a professional, we have to decide when the child says, I don't want to see my other parent anymore. We ask a lot of questions. How long has this been going on? What's the intensity of their feelings? You know, what circumstances led up to this? All kinds of things. But there could be a realistic reason that a child doesn't want to spend time with their other parent anymore. And I've already mentioned child abuse, uh, sexual abuse, those things obviously would be a factor. But again, we've said this before, even in physical abuse cases, we often see children who don't want to be completely estranged from a parent. Mm -hmm. So it's why it throws red flags for us as professionals when a child says, I don't want to see my other parent anymore. Because we were thinking, okay, where is that coming from? This is where the therapeutic community kind of splits because they, there's a faction in the community that says if a child has not seen a parent for a certain period of time and the child is refusing to see that parent and they have a, a set of criteria, then this is absolutely pathological alienation. Mm-hmm. I personally don't think it's that simple. Right. A lot, you know, where is the child in his or her development? Is this a four-year-old? Is this a 10-year-old? Is this a 14-year-old? That matters to explore why a four-year-old would say that, where I could completely understand why a 14-year-old, right, would say that. Uh (laughs) So it's a different dynamic depending on the age of the child. And of course, you have to explore the history of the so-called alienating parent and the history of the resisted parent. But how, whatever terminology you put on it, you have a child who's saying, I don't want to see that parent. And I think that has to be respected until you explore enough to figure out what's going on in the entire family. What too many professionals miss is they don't treat the entire family. And they don't right. really dig and look and see. And, you know, an organization we used to do like a 90-day assessment period just to figure out why is this child saying this about that parent? 
what's mm-hmm. really going on here. And realistic estrangement is something that's it's important because if you miss that and a child has been abused in some way, you're kind of saying, no, you've got to reconnect with your abuser, whether you like it or not. Yeah. And that's So it's important to get that. But there's another piece, and I would even say that in Kelly and Johnson's article, I, if I, I would insert that between estrangement and the alienation, there's more than just pathological alienation. There's protective alienation. Yes. And what, what is meant by that, Rick? Because I know you've seen these cases before. Yeah, it, and it's it's a part that was kind of surprising to to see how it works. There's uh, a parent who, with the greatest intentions, are making decisions about exposure of their children. They're making decisions in order to protect a child. Uh, they think they're protecting them from the other parent for whatever reason that's caused by uh, the divorce or the history, or maybe there was some uh, emotional abuse going on. But they're thinking, I'm protecting my child from that other parent, and I'm doing the best that I know how to do for my child. But then the child begins to pick up on that emotional instability of that parent who's trying to protect and wants to protect the parent. (laughs) And they end up be creating alienating behavior, even though it's they they would never say in fact they never do say i'm alienating they think they're being a really good parent when in fact what i've come to believe they're just making really poor parental choices as yes. far as a parent is concerned with this child and sometimes that has to do with the and i even hesitate to call it the alienating parent because i don't want to put that label on somebody if it doesn't have the same connotation as true parental alienation. But if a parent is engaging in what we would call alienating behaviors, sometimes it's their own individual therapeutic issue. They right. were con- they were controlled by the other parent in the marriage maybe, and they over-identify with their child and maybe a child's distress with that parent. And, oh, my gosh, he or she hurt me this way. They're going to hurt my child in the same way. I better protect my child from having to go through that or that transference of emotion. They can't, they can't separate themselves from the child's emotion. And so they deeply feel the same emotion that their child might be feeling or even feel it more because of their own history. And sometimes it's a history that goes way back to their own childhoods. You know, it's oftentimes we see a parent engaging in alienating behaviors. And when you look at their history, they had a parent that did that to them. (laughs) And it, it's kind of just how, what you do, or sometimes that person didn't have a good example of, um, the importance of father or mother in their life. And they see the other parent as a threat instead of understanding how important the role is. Well, I didn't need that. So my child doesn't need that either. There are all kinds of complicated reasons why a parent would say, I have to protect my child from the other parent. And based on the email I got from this woman that I talked about earlier, I wonder if she was kind of that same type of parent, and I won't go into reading her email, but just some of the things she referred to made me think she didn't really know that she was doing what she was doing until it got pointed out to her. Yeah. That I'm just doing the natural thing of protecting my child, but in that natural protection, I'm actually doing hurtful things to my child by messing with their identity. And yes. there are, I think, a lot of parents that don't understand that connection. That when I tell my child, or even in my body language, say to my child, your other parent is no good. They hurt me and they're going to hurt you too. That the interpretation on the child's end is, 
well, if my dad is bad and I'm half dad, I must be bad too. So they internalize those words and it becomes part of their identity. Yeah. And when you do that to a child consistently, because in your mind, you're trying to get your child to understand why they need to be protected. <laughs> it doesn't have the same result that you intend. Exactly. It ends up having a much different result. And then you're sitting in the courtroom wondering, well, why is everybody calling me an alienator? I was just trying to help my child understand that they had to be careful around this other parent because they're dangerous. Because in my mind, I believe yes. they're emotionally dangerous. And so I think I want to say to our listeners, if we have listeners out there who are being accused of somehow alienating or engaging in alienating behaviors, um, first thing to do is do some self-reflection. You know, even if you don't believe that the other parent is a good person, they have a right to make their own decision about the other parent. Mm -hmm. And they don't need your, they don't need your guidance about that because that is right. sort yes. of sac sacred ground, so to speak. So the big question, if, when we ask, that if we asked in the beginning, can an alienator be reformed or rehabilitated? The answer is it depends. And if it is protective alienation, the answer is absolutely. But it requires some self-reflection. Yeah. Now let's talk about the pathological alienator. So you've got a child who is saying, I don't want to see my other parent. You first check for realistic estrangement. Is it realistic that they would not want to be with that parent based on the parent's behavior? And sometimes yeah, we can treatment fix of the child. that. Yes. Right. Sometimes we can treat that because we can help the other parent understand, okay, your behavior is not appropriate for your 14-year-old daughter. And I'm not saying inappropriate like in an abusive way. Sometimes they just don't know how to talk to their kid. Right. Yeah. Right. And, it, and it, they're alienating themselves from their children because maybe when the children go to their house, all they do is discipline and scream and yell. And they are, they don't really spend quality time of any type with their child and their child's like, you know, why would I want to do that? Why would I want to go over there? It's much safer to just stay over here. So sometimes we find that by working with the estranged parent, we can help him or her figure out where they're maybe missing the mark as a mm -hmm. parent and trying too hard to establish rules in their home with at the detriment of maybe not having an emotional relationship with their children. And so maybe the estranged parent is compromised in some way that they can be helped and there's realistic estrangement going on. We can work with that. If we find that it's protective alienation, it's the, uh, it's the alienating parent who is just trying to protect, and we can get them to have some self-reflection about that. We can work with that. The pathological alienator is a whole different beast, and that's yes. the one you hear about all the time. That's the one that gets talked about in social media. That's the one that everybody wants to create laws and things against and have DSM-5 diagnoses for and, and all that stuff, right? Because yeah. it's more salacious, the things that they do. And, you know, I was in this field for 25 years. I saw my share of those. They were rare. But I saw a handful of those in my career. I saw of, the, of 100 parents, 5%. I'd say five were... <laughs> And I saw more than 100 parents, but I'm just giving you a loose statistic. I would say five were pathological, and the other 95 were either realistic or protective. And some yes. we were able to help, and some we didn't help because they couldn't see what they were doing. And then we had to testify, right? So you, you're you either going to help uh -huh. them or you're going to tell on them. There's like You have two choices, right? The pathological alienator is it's a psychological problem. And we've talked about this before, why it's not in the DSM-5, because it, it's a family interaction issue. You, you can't be a mm -hmm. pathological alienator 
if your kids don't participate in the pathology, right? Right. So, so pathological alienators have something else going on. They have a personality disorder of some sort. That's what's diagnosable. It, yes. It, that disorder manifests in these situations as parental alienation. Just uh, if you had a schizophrenic patient, for instance, maybe some of the behaviors, dangerous behaviors they could participate in would be a manifestation of their disorder, but it doesn't define the disorder. Mm -hmm. So an a pathological alienator has some sort of psychopathy or severe personality disorder as a foundation that's creating the situation. Now we know that some people that could be pathological alienators don't succeed for a couple of reasons. Number one, because the children are too old and yeah, you know, 13, 14, 15, 16 year olds <laughs> don't think that, you know, what, you know, they think they know more than you. So it's hard to alienate mm -hmm. a 14 year old if you start there. Because they're going to look at you like, mm, I don't know. <laughs> it can even be hard to alienate a four-year-old because uh, right. they're much like teenagers, right? They're very defiant. Yep. And if they sense that you really want something badly, they're going to do the opposite just to see what kind of reaction they get out of you. So the age range mm -hmm. where parental alienation at a pathological level really is effective is in that elementary school early elementary, six, seven, eight, nine years old is where it can really take hold. And sometimes, like I said, it starts before the divorce, maybe many years before the divorce. And so that puts kids at that age at a higher risk, I think, for the pathological alienation to succeed. Also, how yeah. the other parent deals with that behavior matters whether or not the children are going to um, participate in the alienation. It's not all that matters, but it can matter if the other parent reacts badly by what the kids say about him or her, or they react in anger and it allows the alienating parent to point a finger and say, see, I told you who they are and now they're acting that way. That can exacerbate it and help the alienation to succeed. So I yeah. think that at the pathological level, if the underlying disorder can't be treated, and oftentimes they can't, because like I said earlier, the personality disordered person, part of their disorder is not being able to see how their behavior affects other people. Um, if that can't be treated, then you're not going to be able to treat the alienating behavior either. And right. so it's harder um, the reunification therapist is not going to treat that behavior. No. A psychiatrist, psychologist, a somebody trained in DBT therapy or something like that might be able to make headway. But the problem is a divorce situation and a custody battle. The disordered person is on steroids with their disorder because they are yeah. terrified of losing the grip on their children. Terrified. That's not the kind of person who's going to have a lot of self-reflection and therapy. Mm -mm. Because I'm completely and overly stimulated emotionally <laughs> to make sure that I hang on to my kids. So it's not the yeah. time necessarily to treat the underlying disorder. Does that make sense? It's probably yes, the worst absolutely. time, probably the worst yep. time to try to treat it because they are so sensitized because of the court case. That's why it's so complicated mm -hmm. because there are so many ways this could go depending on the variables. That's why we can't just get on the bandwagon and go down to our local legislation, House of Representatives and speak and have them make a law. Because it's complicated, yet so many people simplify it or oversimplify it. And I understand why they do, because they're afraid um, that they are losing their kids forever. 
and it's right. deeply, deeply painful. And somebody needs to do something about this. And what I hate to say, but I have to say, because it's my responsibility to say, don't marry somebody and have children yeah. <laughs> with someone this disordered. And people are yes. going to hate me for saying that. But we've all made these mistakes. And it's oh, not the yep. government's job to fix what we, what situation we signed up for. And I know a lot of people, mm. including myself, would say, well, when I married him, I had no idea. Exactly. <laughs> mm -hmm. But that doesn't make it anybody else's responsibility to fix what happened to you or what is now currently happening to, happening to your children. So that's why we, you and I, Rick, in this show constantly talk about how important it is for you to do what you can do, how you can, you must do your best to maintain a relationship with your child, because this is what you're dealing with on the other side. Whether you knew you were signing up for it or not, this is what you got. Yeah. And it's not as easily fixable as everybody wants to pretend that it is. And I want to say to all the professionals listening, we got your back. We understand how hard <laughs> this is. You are in uh -huh. the worst possible field. Anybody could be in for litigation risk, for having your reputation completely um completely annihilated on the internet and social media because somebody doesn't like what you're doing, but it's not your fault. And yeah. yes, there are good professionals out there. There are poor professionals out there. If you are a professional, please, 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 please get appropriately trained before you put your toe in the water of this very complicated field and issue. But once you do, it's one of the hardest fields to be in as a professional because it's so very insidious and complicated and full of people who are ready and waiting to blame somebody else for why they are in this situation that they're in. And I, I find the complication, the hopeful that if it's, if it's, if the solution is only in someone else's power, if the only way to fix something in my life is that the government must do it or a judge must do it, then it leaves me powerless. Right. Uh, but because it's complicated, there's room for hope. There's room for change. There's room for, I mean, in that continuum that you laid out, there's only one aspect that's irredeemable. All the other aspects could be addressed and potentially changed. Right, right. Exactly. I do think there's a lot of hope. Um, it's hard to say that to someone who hasn't seen their child for many years. Oh, and, yeah. And they're, they're going to listen to this and go, you have no idea what I've been through. And mm -hmm. I don't because I did not have to experience that. But I'm also saying that there are, for every one of you who haven't seen your kids for years, and I'm so sorry that that has happened to you, and it is egregious, and maybe your professionals or your legal community did not recognize it when they should have and changed something. There's 99 people who do have more control than they think they do and can get help and can yeah. turn this around at some point in their children's lives and make it okay. And so yeah. we have to turn off the noise of the hopeless and say, wait a minute, there's more to this than the term parental alienation. It's there. Right. It goes deeper than that is what, what we are trying to say. And this is a hard subject to talk about. And it's even, I can feel my, my adrenaline flowing right now as I'm talking about it <laughs> uh -huh. because, because I know I'm putting myself at risk by talking about it in this way of criticism. 
But at the same time, I cannot deny my professional experience and what I've seen right. and what I've been yep. through and the successes I have been able to witness. Um, so it's hard for me to read a lot of rhetoric that makes it sound as if every divorce case includes an alienator because right. it's just not so. It's just right. not so. So take heart. I guess I want to leave this on a positive note. Take heart. If you are a parent or a professional and you see some of these behaviors, it's not going to do you a lot of good to run to the judge and say, oh my gosh, they're alienating because obviously it's, it's being said so much now that it's kind of like the crying wolf and nobody believes, right? It's like, yeah, 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 everybody's mm -hmm. an alienator. <laughs> so do some self-reflection. Um, talk to the right professionals, make sure the professionals you engage are properly trained, um, figure out how to be um, a good example for your children, focus more on your relationship with them than you do on your relationship with the other parent. All of the things that we've been talking about, Rick, for the last three years on this podcast are more important than nailing the other parent for their behaviors. Right. And if you focus on that, it's possible you will never, ever, it's probable, I'm not going to even say possible, it is probable that you will never, ever have a situation like the small percentage of people who are unable to be a parent because of the behaviors of the other parent. And again, that makes me really, really devastatingly sad that there's any of those at all, but you know, that's the world we live in. There's a lot of dev devastating things that happen to people that they don't deserve. And this is one True. of them. But I don't, I just, I want to, I feel protective, especially of our new listeners or people currently going through a divorce. I feel protective of them enough to inform them that parental alienation is often not what you hear that it is. And needing to make sure they're properly informed. Yep. Can I get an amen? Amen. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I, I feel like I just preached a sermon and that was not my intention. But I think that <laughs> like I said, I get worked up over this subject matter. So Well, it is an intense subject and there's there's a lot going on here and a lot of pain. Um yep. that that we've experienced and we see people experiencing uh, that we want to help right. with. So of course there's passion behind it. Sure. I do want to say, I want to talk a minute, Rick, about our impact training. You and I don't talk about this, uh, about something that we offer very often, but I think this is an episode that probably mm -hmm. is a good time to talk about it. Rick and I do something called impact and it's a international masterclass on parent and conflict training is what it stands for. But what it really is, it's more than just teaching professionals how to be parenting coordinators or uh, reunification therapists or parenting coaches, that kind of thing. It's, it's about how to build a practice that is holistic around this issue of high conflict divorce how to interact with your local legal community and judges to make them aware of why and how you do what you do so that you can begin to build in your community um, more education as well as the expertise to address some of these issues that parents are going through that are so difficult. And so if you are um, a professional listener, uh, I am creating a page called our training page on our website. So you can go to cpdilemmas.com slash training and learn more about it. And there's a form you can fill out to get more information. And we invite you to do that because we would love to be able to work with your team. Uh, and it does take a team. This is not something a professional wants to do on his or her own. It's too right. complicated and too difficult. So it's a matter of putting a team together that works together. Even if you're in different offices, you don't have to be in the same office, but putting together a team of mental health professionals who can address these issues from a perspective of treating every family member. 
because that's what you have to do. Um, working with each family member in the situation to bring it to a, a more positive close than maybe what the court is able to do. So check out yeah. our, our impact training on cpdilemmas.com slash training. Yes. Fantastic. All right. Great. It was good talking with you and we will chat next week. Yep. Bye-bye everybody. All right. Bye. The information contained in this podcast is generic. It must not be misconstrued as constituting legal or psychological advice. Decisions relevant to any specific individual, family system, or case require the direct evaluation of skilled, child-centered professionals.